I'm Phil Bowden and I have presented the early season canola insect management workshops and the canola crop walks across New South Wales this year. Uh, it's been funded by GRDC, managed by FarmLink, with resources provided by CESAR at Melbourne University. And this webinar is being hosted by RCMG and the FarmLink team. Next slide, Carl. So we've looked at many canola crops, some in drought affected regions and seen a range of pests and natural enemies in most of these crops. In general, the pest pressure has been relatively light, although we have seen some high numbers of aphids in early sown winter varieties, uh, particularly used for grazing. But these pests were generally well controlled by high numbers of parasitic wasps, hoverflies and lady beetles. Here are some of the photos taken during the crop walks at a few of a few of these insects. It's been really encouraging to see many of the participants using their skills from the workshops to monitor and identify the different pests and natural enemies. And we've had lots using their macro lenses that we gave out and taken some really excellent photographs. The main insect problem we have noticed this year has been the widespread incidence of green peach aphid. Dealing with green peach aphid brings several important issues that growers need to be aware of. It has a wide host range that can be part of a green bridge, bringing aphids into early contact with emerging canola. It can have high levels of resistance to many insecticides and as a vector for crop devastating viruses, including turnip yellows in canola. We will discuss these points in detail uh, with the team from CESAR. Dr. Jess Lai and Julia Severi talk about the importance of natural enemies for control of these pests. And we're going to hear about some of the latest research happening at Melbourne Uni with PhD student Samantha Ward. So we welcome your interaction with these, with these researchers and I'll hand over now to Julia, who many of you would know from the PestFacts service. Thank you, Julia. Okay, Julia, have we got you there on the line? Yes, yep, I'm here. Great. Fantastic. And look, just before we do start, it's uh, Carl Larson from RMCG here. Just if it is your first time joining a GoTo webinar session and you're joining remotely, um, we've got a bit of a different setup today. We've got a, a, a big live audience with Phil Bowden um, there in, in central New South Wales, um, but we've also got a number of people joining us um, from around the country as well. So if it is your first um, webinar, just very quickly, you'll see on the GoTo webinar control panel, there's a bit of a section um, with handouts. So I'll talk to that a little bit later on, but there's some resources there that you can download that Phil will make available to those joining live as well. Um, and most importantly, a question pane there for you to type any questions that will come straight through to me that we can put to our research team at the end during the Q&A panel. So without further ado, Julia, I'll hand over to you to take us through the ID and monitoring of GPA. Thanks, Julia. Great, thank you very much. Um, it's, as Carl mentioned, I'm gonna talk about aphids in canola from an identification and monitoring perspective. Um, we'll get to the next slide, please. So aphids are problematic in canola for um, two main reasons. Um, primarily, it's because they are vectors of virus. Um, primarily, one of, the, one of the main viruses is turnip yellows virus, which was formerly known as um, beet western yellows virus. Um, but they can also do damage um, by feeding when they're in very high numbers. Um, you know, they suck the moisture and nutrients out of plants when they're in high numbers, and they can lead to um, wilting and plant distortion and sometimes plant death. Um, there are three main species which occur in canola, aphid species. That's uh, green peach aphid, we've got turnip aphid and cabbage aphid. Um, the correct management of these aphid species always begins with um, uh, I correct identification. Um, and so you want to be able to tell green peach aphid apart from um, turnip aphid and cabbage aphid 
Um, and that's for three main reasons. Um, the first being that green peach aphid is actually the primary vector of um, turnip yellows virus. Cabbage aphid and turnip aphid, they can both transmit the virus, but um, not with the same efficiency. Uh, the second reason is that green peach aphid is more of an issue at uh, crop establishment, um, whereas cabbage aphid and turnip aphid, yes, they can be a problem at crop establishment, um, but they are more of an issue as we move into sort of flowering and, and maturing uh, crops when the pods are forming. Um, and then also a third reason why we want to tell green peach aphid apart is that it has evolved resistance to several chemical uh, mode of action groups, um, which Jess will talk about a bit later. Next slide, please. So when we're wanting to ID an aphid, um, we want to start with looking at wingless adults. These are the easiest stage to identify. Um, aphids are usually there in groups um, and you, you pick the, the biggest aphid there that doesn't have wings. Um, we really want to avoid trying to ID aphids from the winged version. It's just too difficult in field. Um, we also want to avoid uh, looking at aphids that are transitioning from wingless to winged. And you can see that um, in that middle photo um, down the bottom there, the aphids starting to form wing buds. So we don't want to use those for identification either. Um, we also don't want to use um, the immature nymphs. They're, they're, they're much smaller, their features just aren't fully formed yet. So really we want to be picking wingless adults. Next slide, please. So when we're IDing an aphid, um, you know, there's some general features that we can look for. Um, and, and this comes down to color. Um, then there's also appearance, whether they're furry, waxy, are they shimmery, or are they glossy or matte? Um, but then there's also other distinguishing features like uh, blotches and, and, and black bars on them. Um, so these are the general features that we can look at. Um, today, I just wanna go one step further and start looking at some more detailed features. Uh, and that's because you know technology is great now. Um, there's these affordable macro lenses that you can just clip on your smartphone to take a photo and zoom in. And some of these features are much more obvious now. So two things that we can look, on, look at to help with our aphid ID is uh, these exhaust pipes. So these are these two appendages sitting there on the back of the aphid toward the, towards the end. And you can look at those, um, they're called siphuncles actually. Um, we just say uh, exhaust pipes colloquially. And you can look at the, the length of these exhaust pipes relative to their tail. So that's that um, tail there in the middle between the, the exhaust pipes. Um, which is called a quarter. We can also look to the shape of the tubercles. So this is the area between the two antennae there on the head. This can give us a clue to, uh, for ID as well. Uh, next slide, please. So when we're looking at um, general features for, for these three aphids, green peach aphid is generally a, a green colour um, and it's quite shimmery and it almost has like a, a juke like um, appearance to it. But then you look at a, a, a turnip aphid in comparison, um, it's quite often a darker, duller um, uh, sort of green. Um, the legs are often quite darker uh, and the turnip aphids actually um, often covered with a very light coating of wax. And um, the coating is not always even, and, and this gives this um, appearance of sort of darker black bars on their back. And then looking at a cabbage aphid, um, these are quite often, more often than not, covered in a, a, a white furry layer, um, as you can see there on that uh, canola um, stem. Um, and they also often have um, these dark sort of black bars on their back. Um, and they're also more of a, a bluey gray, dull bluey, bluey gray and quite matte um, in appearance, matte color. We'll go to the next slide. There's some, uh, there are some exceptions to these rules. Um, green peach aphid, despite its name, can actually vary in color quite a bit from um, reds to blues to yellows. Even when they are that kind of standard green, they sometimes have these dark green um, markings on their backs. Uh, and I find that this morph in particular um, does sometimes make um, agronomists second guess their, their ID with green peach aphid. 
Um, there's also the fact that when aphids shed, so that when they're moving between their growth stages, uh, they can, um, they, that when they're freshly shed, they don't quite have their features yet. Um, you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, that's a cabbage aphid. It's recently shed and it doesn't have any of its um, you know, typical wax coating yet. Uh, and then there's also when um, uh, aphids have been parasitized, um, they turn into bloated aphid mummies and, um, and Sam will talk about that a bit later. So now looking at taking a close look at aphids and some of those more detailed features I was talking, talking about before. So we can look at their um, exhaust pipes there right at the bottom of the aphid. So the exhaust pipes on a green peach aphid, they're, they're um, quite long. Um, they extend past the base of their little tail in between. Whereas if you look at the turnip aphid there in the middle, their exhaust pipes are a bit shorter and they don't quite reach the base of their tail there in the middle. And then we move on to the, the cabbage aphid. Their exhaust pipes are very, very reduced. They're almost like little stumps and they're nowhere near the base of their tail. And I, I can see these features with a, a smart frame macro lens. Agronomists often send me photos um, of aphids and this is the feature that I often use. And we can also look at those tubicles that I was talking about, that space between their head. Um, in a green peach aphid is a very well-defined formed shape between their head, um, sorry, between the antennae on their head. And, and the shapes sort of converge inwards. Whereas the space between the antennae on your turnip aphid and your cabbage aphid, these tubicles, they're relatively flat. So this is a key difference with green peach aphid. We'll go to the next slide. So when are aphids active? Um, they're pretty much active all year round, but we have, um, they are more probably problematic um, in autumn and in spring. Uh, they, they seem to be, their reproduction and their movement seems to very much slow in, in winter. But when we do have milder than usual winters, um, they can be a little bit problematic in winter also, as we've seen this year. This graph here is, um, shows when there is peak flights of um, winged aphids and when they're moving around and flying. So we've got them in, a rule of thumb is sort of early autumn and also in spring. And it's really this early autumn um, migration of of aphids that puts uh, canola at risk of um, contracting turnip yellows virus and also getting early establishment of aphids. We'll go to the next slide. So if you want to uh, monitor uh, for winged aphid activity, you can put these uh, sticky traps on your fences. Um, they will catch the aphid, aphid flights um, on the sticky surface. You won't be able to tell what species they are, but at least it will give you an indication when there are aphids uh, moving around. They're just too hard to, as I mentioned before, they're just too hard to um, tell at that, a -like, well, that, at that wing stage. Um, and they're also quite squashed on there, but it's a good indication of when they're moving. Go to the next slide. So for monitoring for green peach aphid, um, we really want to be looking underneath the leaves. Um, that's at establishment. And also as the crop um, flowers, green peach aphid tend to stay underneath the leaves. Um, and as the crop grows, they're, they're more likely to be found in the lower canopy, which is why they're not too much of an issue um, moving into spring, typically. Um, cabbage aphid and turnip aphid at establishment, they can also be underneath the leaves, um, but they are, um, as the crop grows, they're more likely to move up onto your stems, your pods and, and your flowers in spring. Um, we have seen green peach aphid act a bit atypically um, it, it, this year also, and also a bit last year, um, in sort of warm, drier years, they have um, moved onto flowers and stems, not to the same extent as what a cabbage aphid um, would, um, but ultimately we're not too sure um, what kind of impact um, that, you know, would have on a crop if GPA um, do do, or green peach aphid do do that. I think that's my last slide there, Carl, before moving on to Jess.
Fantastic. Thanks for that, Julia. And uh, just a reminder to send through those questions. Um, I've got a couple that have come through, but what I might do is hold those over for the Q&A session. And um, we're going to now get Jess, uh, Dr. Jessica Lai, also from Caesar, just to talk to us about pesticide resistance in green peach aphid. And you heard Julia mention that uh, there are a few issues emerging in her presentation, but Jess, over to you to um, take us through that in some more detail. Thank you so much, Carl. If you could just flick to the first slide. Cheers. So I'm not going to go over too much of the biology of, of GPA. Julia gave you a bit of an overview there, but I will say that it's a very cosmopolitan aphid. It's, it's found worldwide. And obviously it has an appetite for brassica species as well as a range of other crops. So that means that it's often found as a pest in horticultural regions in Australia and also grain growing regions, specifically canola growing areas, as you would know. So the plant damage from feeding is pretty typical in terms of symptomology you might expect from aphid feeding. You might get wilting, loss of vigour, um, you might see some honeydew. Uh, and of course, if the virus is tran transmitted through the aphid feeding, the symptomology can become more severe. You could go to the next slide, please, Carl. So in 2012, we started to see the first signs of pyrethroid resistance evolving in Australia. So you can see that map on the left is a map of where we had found through screening efforts, um, populations of GPA that were showing resistance for pyre pyrethroids. And those are shown by the, the red dots with sensitive or susceptible populations shown by green dots. If you fast forward a few years to the map on the right, you can see that the, um, the resistance is popping up in quite a few more locations. So initially in 2012, we were picking up resistance in WA, some in Queensland and a bit in SA. Um, more recently, we're seeing resistance has, has definitely spread or is being found also in Victoria and Tasmania. So if you just go to the next slide, please, Carl. So this is also the case for carbon mate resistance. You can see the map there um, from 2012 on the left. We were seeing it in a few locations in WA, Queensland, SA, and a bit in Vic. And you can see on the right, our more recent results indicate that that resistance is found much more commonly around Australia today. So in fact, when we screen for resistance in GPA populations um, today, 99% of those populations we test for are going to have resistance to both pyrethroids and carbamates. So that's your pyramor, your alpha cypermethrin, and your bifenthrin. Next slide, please, Carl. So back in 2012, there was also some resistance starting to occur to organophosphate. So you can see those results on the, on the map on, on the left there. And fast forwarding a few years, you can see that that resistance is now being found throughout Australia. So it's spread quite quickly or evolved um, quite quickly in, in other populations. So in 2012, we'd originally found no resistance to mere nicotinoids, but in the past three to four years, through some bioassay work that we've been doing, um, we are now seeing resistance um, for neonicotinoids um, across Australia. So you can see that by the map there. So this is of course concerning. One point I'd like, like to make is that not all types of resistances are created equal. So there are different ways a pest can um, develop resistance. So for GPA resistance that we're finding in Australia, we're actually dealing at the moment with two types, target site resistance and metabolic resistance. So let's have a bit of a closer look at those two types of resistance. Thanks, Carl. So for your carbamates and pyrethroids, they fall into this category of target site resistance. So usually you would have a receptor protein that under normal circumstances, your insecticide would bind to and block the activity of that receptor protein. Next slide, please, Carl. Thank you. So usually you would get inhibition of that function of that receptor. Next slide, please, Carl. So when you get a target site resistance, the confirmation of that active site of that receptor protein is changed. And that means the insecticide can no longer bind to that site and block the function of that receptor protein. However, the endogenous proteins 
could still bind there. So essentially, this is an on-off type of resistance. If you have a target site resistance or target site mutation, you're unlikely to get any sort of um, effectiveness from the chemical that you're using. Next slide, please, Carl. And next slide. Okay, so let's have a look at how target site resistance actually works in practice. You can see here some results from some bioassay testing that we have done on alpha-cyphomethrin, a pyrethroid, and also primacarb, which is a carbamate. On the left axis, um, on the on the y-axis, you can see mortality of aphids in percentages, and down the bottom, you can see the concentration of those chemicals that we have used in this bioassay. Little black dots denote um, sensitive populations of aphids that we've used in this bioassay. So that's a sensitive population of aphids of GPA that we have uh, maintained since 2002. So we know it doesn't have any resistance to, um, to any chemicals. And the little open circles are the resistant population of GPA. So you can see on that graph on the left, for instance, that no matter what concentration of alpha cypermethrin you're, um, you're using, even at the field rate, you're not getting any knockdown of those aphids. And that is similar for perimicarb. Next slide, please, Carl. So with metabolic resistance, it's a little bit different. So under normal circumstances, insects and, and any organism usually have um, a way to detoxify chemicals in its body that it shouldn't have. So it would have these enzymes that would break down and mop up those toxins. So in the case of metabolic resistance, next, next slide please, Carl. What you would get is an increased ability from the insect to detoxify those chemicals. So for instance, it may have more enzymes that would allow it to do this. Next slide please, Carl. So having a look at a few bioassays for organophosphates and neonicotinoids. So these are the um, actives that fall under that category of metabolic resistance um, for the resistances that we see in Australia. Um, so if you look at the graph on the left where we've tested dimethoate, you can see that at the field rate, we are not getting as much knockdown or mortality of aphids that we would get or see in the susceptible um, aphid population. If you increase that field rate, you eventually do get 100% knockdown of those aphids, but you can see that it does take a it does take longer to get there. You need to increase that rate. On the right, in the case of neonicotinoid resistance, at the field rate, we're still getting 100% knockdown. However, um, the the percentage of aphids that are um, knocked down. Um, earlier on at lower concentrations is, is not as high as with the susceptible population. So it really does um, emphasise how important it is to, um, to treat your crops at the recommended um, or at, at the recommended rate for, for these chemistries. So if you could move forward, Carl. Okay. So just as a summary, as, a, as I've pointed out, your synthetic, synthetic pyrethroids and carbamates in Australia, we see that we have target site resistance, which is that on-off resistance. So we wouldn't recommend that you use these for DPA control. Organophosphates, um, this is a metabolic type of resistance. So you might get a little bit of control. Um, maybe it depends on the level of resistance in your GPA population. So this can be a bit more touch and go. We would certainly recommend um, perhaps having a test strip where you, um, you spray this, um, the chemical um, organophosphate and just check what the level of control is before you spray any more. And then with neonicotinoid resistance, you may see um, a slight reduction in the control at the moment if you have a population that is, that is resistant. If uh, neonicotinoids are still used quite commonly as a seed treatment, we might see that there, um, there is continued selection pressure for resistance to neonics. We might see levels of control decrease. So I would just like to finish up the presentation with a little bit of um, a discussion around um, some more recent results that have come out of Europe and also some work that's been done in Australia. Um, and that's work that has um, really highlighted how mindful we need to be about retaining the use of one of our actives, actives which is sulfloxifor. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Next slide, please, Carl. Okay, 
So there is a mutation um, found in GPA overseas and it's called R81T and it's a target site mutation. So what this does is it confers a very, very high level of resistance to neonics to GPA. We don't have this mutation at all in Australia. You can see by the bioassay graph on the left here that at the field rate, you're not getting the level of control that you would need in the field um, when using a metacloprid. So it's one of those stop, go, on, off mutations. The thing about R81T, it also confers a high level of resistance to um, sulfoxaflor, which would of course be a problem if we were to get that mutation in Australia. So next slide please, Carl. The good news is we are doing ongoing monitoring for R81T in Australia. So we're, we're sending out sticky traps, we're getting them posted back to us and we're doing genetic testing to test for that particular mutation. Next slide, please, Carl. So at the end of 2018, we um, had some reports of some control failures um, for um, use of sulfoxaflor on GPA in, in WA uh, near Esperance. So um, with our partners, uh, GRDC, Corteva and DPIRT, we did some collections of those GPA populations and we collected 13 populations in total. As a first step with these populations, we tested them for the R81T mutation, and we found that it wasn't found in any of these populations, which is really good news. Next slide, please, Carl. We then undertook bioassays for aphid mortality in response to sulfoxaflor application. So with our other bioassays, we compared results to populations of susceptible GPA, as I had shown you earlier and we'd maintain these populations for quite some time. So due to time constraints today, I've provided a summary schematic that represents compiled data across populations for these tests. And through these bioassays, we did find a sensitivity shift in these WA populations to sulfoxaflor. So you can see that by the light green um, line in the middle there. And the brown line on the right shows the kind of reaction we would expect if we were to have the, um, the R81T mutation found currently overseas in Europe. So these bioassays were repeated several months later to confirm our results. So it looks like um, we, are, we have the first signs of resistance evolving to sulfoxaflora in GPA. However, the genetic mechanisms remain unknown and we're currently doing some further investigation into what those mechanisms might be for those WA populations. However, as I said, the good news is we don't have the R81T mutation present in Australia. Next slide, please, Carl. So I'll finish off with some take home points. Uh, there is a resistance management strategy available for green peach aphid and we'd strongly recommend that growers and advisors become really familiar with this document and you can find that on the GRDC website. It's obviously very important to know how to identify what aphid you have in your crops and Julia really highlighted this. If you confuse GPA with a turnip aphid or cabbage aphid, for instance, you might be wasting your time by, um, and money by spraying. So if in doubt, you can send your samples to your local PESFAX service. There's a whole host of beneficial insects that will help control your aphid populations. And we're really lucky to have Sam here today, who's going to speak to us a bit about that. But you can also find really good information about these beneficials in the beneficial back pocket guide that's available from the GRDC and also in the iSpy insect identification manual that can be found online. Also, there are some obviously cultural controls that you can consider to minimise your risk from GPA. So at the beginning of the season and, and beforehand, reducing your virus inoculum in the surrounding area through weed control, making sure the paddock is free of weeds 10 to 14 days before sowing, and also sowing into standing stubble to limit the risk of um, GPA landing on, on your paddock. And rotation of chemi chemistries is really important as is not cutting rates. So when using transform to control uh, green peach aphid, for instance, it's really important that this product is applied with optimum coverage. So the way transform works is it has acropetal movement in the plant. So that means it moves up in the xylem um, or in the stem and it doesn't translocate downwards. So it's really important to get that really good coverage 
Okay, so I'm going to leave it there, Carl, um, and uh, in the interest of time. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks for that, Jess. Really good overview and some great research too um, from overseas and looking at the applicability of that in the Australian context. So um, really great and worthwhile updates. Thanks very much for that. Um, we are running against the clock with a, a pretty packed one hour session. So I'd like to move on now to um, Samantha Ward's presentation. And I'll just bring up uh, Sam, your slides now. Um, Sam's going to be talking to us about understanding and incorporating aphid parasitoids within IPM strategies in Australian grain crops. So Sam, over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I'm going to be talking about what I've been undertaking for my PhD. Uh, so next slide, please. So firstly, what are parasitoids? So parasitoids like parasites need a host to develop, but differ in that they kill their host during their development. And aphid parasitoids feed on nectar, so they need plants around. But if, if this is an issue, then they feed on the honeydew, which is excreted by aphids. But this is not as nutritious as the nectar. And they lay their eggs within the aphid using a modified sting. And then their larvae develop within the aphid when it becomes this obvious mummy that we've shown you photos of before. Uh, and certain groups actually develop below the mummy as well. So they're very useful for integrated pest management as a form of biological control. Next slide, please. So a lot of people aren't aware of how many parasitic wasps we have associated with aphids. So they're, they're generalist in that most of them will attack any aphid, but they're specialist in that they won't attack other, other bugs or other insects. So you have your aphid host, and the second level down that you can see there, you have your primary parasitoids. So the main one being the aphidines, but you also have aphylinids that are slightly smaller that come around usually towards the end of the year. You also have secondary parasitoids, and these are in two different groups. So you have your hyperparasitoids and your mummy parasitoids. Uh, next slide, please. So there's a difference between these secondary parasitoids. These are, these are the bad guys. So, you know, you might be, you'll be looking for the primary parasitoids because they kill the aphids, but these secondary parasitoids come in and stop those primary parasitoids from reproducing. So hyperparasitoids attack the aphid before it becomes <coughs> engorged and golden and becomes a mummy. They lay the eggs inside that primary parasitoid that's already developing inside there, and then they wait until it becomes a mummy and then they develop themselves. But mummy parasitoids attack an already developed mummy regardless of what wasps are already inside there, and then their larvae develop immediately. Next slide, please. But obviously that's not the whole story. You also have other natural enemies. So you have predators, as so you can see on the slide, and also pathogens. And these all uh, are integrated with the, the parasitoids. They can negative, negatively affect the parasitoid development. So for example, ladybirds can actually eat the, the mummies. Uh, next slide, please. So what are we doing? I'll talk about the latter three slightly later on, uh, but the main thing I've been doing for the last couple of years is monitoring aphid pests and their natural enemies uh, within grain crops, and I've got particular emphasis on the wasps as that's my background. Next slide, please. So what did we find? Well, in 2017, we weren't so selective on the sites that we were looking at. We picked sprayed and seed-treated canola and wheat crops, uh, sprayed with all sorts of different sprays and this is just the results from one loop that we did and as you can see with the the map it's up in the north of Victoria around Shepparton uh, sort of quite close to the New South Wales border and we found that uh, the aphids uh, we, and we separate these as well into alates the winged aphids and the aptry the unwinged aphids and also the mummies they all peaked in October of that year next slide please we also went out pan trapping. So we created these pan traps. These are actually uh, very cheap yellow uh, plastic camping plates. And we took those out and uh, put, popped in there a little bit of detergent and water, which was great throughout the, the season, apart from when it started getting extremely cold. And then we had to use propylene glycol, so antifreeze. So we put those out and we found the same with the aptry, the unwinged aphids, that they all peaked in October. But it was very different with the winged aphids. They peaked early on in the season, so around May. 
And we think that was because there is a bit of a trapping bias with these, that they were uh, attracted to the yellow color of the, the traps, thinking that they were a food source. Next slide, please. So we did the same with predators as well. So we looked at lacewings, spiders, hoverflies, and uh, predatory bugs. And you can see here that most of them peaked around October, uh, but it was slightly variable as to when, when some of them, like the hoverflies, peaked. So they had a couple of peaks earlier on in the season. Next slide, please. We also did the same with, sorry, that, um, that graph at the top, this sort of overlaying the rest there, you can't really see the, the others behind, apologies about that. But you can see it's slightly variable. We split the predatory beetles into rove beetles, ladybirds, and ground beetles. And they were quite variable as to when they, they peaked. But when you lump them all together, we saw a noticeable uh, increase in trip six. So that was around November time. Uh, and next slide, please. So just to make that a bit easier to, to sort of visualize, I've made it as a schematic. So you can see there on the top level, you've got your pests. And this is all to do with the pan traps for that year. So you can see that the alates, the winged aphids, peaked in May at the beginning of the season. And then the aptry, the unwinged aphids, peaked in October. And you can see this coincides with most of the, uh, the predators peaking around the same time. Obviously, there was some slight difference. We had a few of the beetles peaking around it. But because they're generalists, they also have other pests and other insects that they can feed on. Next slide, please. But we also did the same with wasps. So not only were we going out and directly sampling, by directly sampling, I mean just literally using your hands and pulling, pulling insects off the leaves, but we also reared wasps. So we went out, we collected the mummies by hand, took them into the lab, and then reared the wasps and uh, saw what we had there. Now, this is just the, the count on the side. We went out uh, throughout the season yet again, and this coincided with the pan trapping. And you can see that there are two peaks there as to when we reared the, the most wasps. Uh, next slide, please. So I popped them into the schematic as well. And you can see uh, they're the starred pictures there, that they peak around or just after the timing of the aphids. Now, we know from the uh, statistics that a lot of these predators are positively affected by the presence of the aphids. But this is even more so with the aphid parasitoids because they are so much more specific in, in their host. And with a lot of the biological controls used for aphid or, or any parasitoid wasp, usually you have a peak in the pest species and then there's a slight uh, pause and then there's a peak in the parasitoid species. And they're very much sort of in tandem with one another. And as soon as the pest species crashes, the aphid species, uh, the aphid parasitoids or pest uh, parasitoid species then crashes afterwards. So as you can see here, it's around the same time, if not slightly afterwards, that the pests are, are around that the, the wasps come in. Uh, next slide, please. So we did the same the following year. We were a little bit more selective with our sites. This time we picked sea treated only sites, uh, not sprayed. So we looked at canola paddocks and we also looked at wheat paddocks. And I've lumped these in together for the, for the purposes of this presentation. So instead of pan trapping this time, we used a vacuum sample, so sort of a big hoover. And we saw that there was a peak, so the aphids uh, graph is on the left-hand side. We saw a peak again in October, so exactly the same with the previous year, uh, the sprayed sites. And again, many more aptries, so unwinged aphids that we were finding, but also the, uh, the alates, the winged aphids as well. And we also did the same for the aphid parasitoids. So we found uh, that they peaked at the end of the season. So again, just after the, what, uh, the aphids came in. And I separated those out between primary parasitoids, hyperparasitoids, and mummy parasitoids. And you can see there they all increase at the same time together. Uh, next slide, please. And again, we reared out wasps. So we collected mummies uh, and reared those out in the lab, the wasps. And these are, I've split them up again into primary parasitoids we reared out, hyperparasitoids, and mummy parasitoids. And quite interestingly, uh, the top graph there are the ones from 2017 and the bottom are from 2018. And we find, found that there were two big peaks of hyperparasitoids for the 2017 uh, sampling, which was where more sprays were used. Now, obviously, you don't want these guys, particularly early on in the season, but you don't want them really at any time because they stop those primary parasitoids that are controlling the aphids from developing. And so this is actually quite a negative, whereas in 2018, you see this beautiful, sort of very clean 
uh, graph where you have your primary parasitoids out competing uh, the hyperparasitoids and the mummy parasitoids that will increase afterwards. And they are directly related with the statistics are showing that those hyperparasitoids and mummy parasitoids are affected by the presence of the primary parasitoids because obviously they need them to, to reproduce themselves. Uh, next slide, please. So we took it another step further. So those aphidines were one of those types of primary parasitoids I mentioned before. We picked these just because very little has been done about them. You have the aphelinins as well, but they're much fewer and further between. And they're also just found really at the end of the season, whereas aphidines are all the way throughout. So I looked at the species that we reared from the two years in Victoria and found that you had one really predominant species, which is called Diarotella rapi. Now this outcompeted absolutely everything. Uh, and next slide, please. Interestingly, we found the exact same thing uh, nationwide. So within 2017, up until this year, and we still have, have samples to go through, we're finding a massive sway towards the Dirotella rapi. The next three are uh, Aphidius colmani, which you may have heard of, Aphidius ervi, again, can be um, bought as well, and uh, Lisa flevis testosipes, it's a bit of a mouthful there. Uh, they're the next three um, that we found that are common, both in Victoria and around Australia. Uh, next slide, please. And so I separated those out per state, and we have this, this is just for 2018, but we have this for, for multiple years. Uh, the number that was sent in, the number of samples, did vary, that's the end number at the top of each of the charts, varied throughout uh, each of the states, but as you can see, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear, a massive sway towards Dirotella rapi for each of those states. Uh, next slide, please. So what's the story so far? Well, this Dirotella rapi, it predominates grain aphid, and I'm speaking about green peach aphid and cabbage aphids, uh, parasitism across each of these states. It even outcompeted Aphidius colmani, which is the wash you may have heard of, during manipulated studies. So we actually went out for an experiment uh, to put these Aphidius colmani into the field and found when we came back that actually Dirotella rapi had completely knocked it out and was parasitizing the aphids that we put out there. Uh, we also found beneficial abundance has increased and decreased in tandem with aphid populations with aphids and their parasitic wasps peaking in and around of October of both years. And this is likely because this is when flowering happened, there's a greater biomass, more plant food sources for both the aphids and the parasitoids. Next slide, please. And we also looked at a few other variables. So we looked at edge type. So we, we had shelter belts, which were from old growth gum trees with an undergrowth and grassy refuges. So these are unsprayed sort of grassy banks uh, or neighboring paddocks that were used for, uh, for grazing. We also looked at different crops, so wheat and canola. And those pan traps I mentioned before, we also looked at the distance from the edge. So we had them at the edge, 10 meters into the paddock and 30 meters into the paddock. And we found that this had no effect on the uh, wasp abundance and diversity as well. Uh, next slide, please. So that's all the general monitoring side of things. Uh, but this is just a bit of further work that's going on. And I think this is really interesting to you because it's much more applied and um, you know, fingers crossed we get some good results from it. But this is something that's ongoing at the moment. This is a nationwide project uh, funded through the GRDC. And it's understanding the difference between observed and actual rates of green peach aphid parasitism in canola. So this is a map of the different sites we've got. And we've also got a WA as well, it's happening. And we're asking the question, when you're scouting canola paddocks around Australia, what does the observed parasitism rate of green peach aphid means in mean in terms of actual parasitism rate? So if you go out and you pick, select a load of aphids, green peach aphids, and then a load of mummies, and you think, all right, I've got about 20% of those are mummies, I have 20% parasitism rate, this may not actually be the truth. So it takes about two to three days for those aphids to develop into mummies. So they could be parasitized already. So what we're doing is collecting all of those aphids, seemingly unparasitized aphids and the mummies, taking them back to the lab and rearing out anything we can find. Also, a lot of those mummies may not uh, develop through and produce an, uh, an aphid parasitoid as well. And we're also looking how this varies throughout time, spatially within a paddock, from state to state, and with different composition of parasitoids. Uh, next slide, please. We also have a couple of lab experiments going on. 
So we're looking at the effects of seed treatments on green peach aphid parasitism by a wasp and also predation by the green lacewing. So we're looking at this in a direct sense and an indirect sense. So we're following it through to the next generation and we're looking at how they reproduce, how they develop and also how they survive. Uh, this has also been followed through in uh, with Sardi, who's looking at the same thing with Diamondback Moth. Uh, and we're also looking at the effects of insecticide resistance clones of the Greek green peach aphid on different parasitism rates by one particular wasp. So as we've already spoken about today, uh, green peach aphid has developed resistance to a lot of over, over 74 insecticides. Uh, and we want to see if this, these different clones have a different effect on how they're parasitized. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to do a final plug before I go. Uh, please, can I have your monies? Uh, I'm still collecting this year. And uh, the, more, the more data I have, the better. I can find out a lot more trends and start distribution mapping the, the wasps. So the information I've got on the, the slide there, that's sort of the minimal data I'd require to go alongside the samples. Uh, on your handout as well, I think there's a, a PESFAX article there and also on CESA there's a, a place that you can look at as to how to package those mummies. Uh, but that's my, uh, my address there at the bottom and there's also a link there as well. Um, and yeah, final slide please. Thank you very much for listening. Great, thanks for that Sam. Um, really excellent research update, so thanks very much. Um, I'm conscious there was a lot of content there um, and no doubt people will have questions. So it's now time to turn over to you, the audience, um, and put a question to either of our, our presenters or as a group, if you'd like. And um, we've got Kylie Dunstan from FarmLink roving the live workshop room with a mobile. So she's gonna type in some questions as they come through from there. So please get those going. While we're waiting, uh, we did have a question, uh, Jess, from Michael that came in in relation to your resistance management um, presentation, just asking whether the resistance tests for SPs and OPs um, were taken from possible suspected samples or was the sampling actually randomised across uh, the country and timelines? So the, the resistance um, testing was a um, result of samples being um, sent in. Yeah. And that was, it was in response to people. Some and some not. Yeah, so it was, it was a, the, the testing was very widespread. Um, in terms of why the testing was first begun, um, it would have been begun because there would, there would have been quick questions around control failures. Um, but the the testing of populations were not necessarily just of populations where there were um, possible or, or reported control failures. There were there were very widespread surveys, so um, lots of populations of GPA picked up where we could where we could grab them or from being sent in. Great, thanks for that, Jess. And just a follow-on question from that as well. Um, do you have any insights as to why New South Wales seems to have a delayed time frame compared to, say, states like WA and South Australia? Um, that's a that's a really good question, um, and it and it can be hard to say. I mean, I think it's important to remember with GPA and with other pests um, that are particularly prone to developing resistance. Um, they are also pests in other industries. So not just grains, um, not just canola. So um, for instance, there are certain areas in Australia, um, let's, let's take um, Queensland, for example, some southern parts of Queensland where there is um, grain growing, but there's also a lot of horticultural crops being grown. Um, and so those horticulturalists will also be controlling this aphid. So, um, whether there, there are um, impacts on resistance evolving from selection pressures applied by other industries, it's entirely possible. That could be um, one possible answer. Um, and, 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 and there are, you know, surely there would be um, impacts on, on environmental um, influences there as well. Great, thanks for that, Jess. And just um, a question we've had come in as well. Uh, for Julia and also um, probably you, Jess, as well. 
Julie, you touched on um, there being, you know, both red and green forms of, of green peach aphid. Just wondering whether the red form of GPA is more resistant to insecticides than the green types. Can you give us some insights on that? Um, so we think that oh, at this stage we believe that's a, um, a bit of a myth that the red form is more insecticide resistant than the green form. Um, we did a colleague of mine did some testing a few years back, um, and the dose response curve um, to insecticides was the same. Um, so no difference between the red and green form. Um, we just think that probably that the red form, it looks more obvious in crops than the green form. So if there's a control failure, you're more likely to take notice of the darker sort of red form rather than the camouflage green form. Right, okay, no, thanks for that and uh, a good clarification. Um, I'm just wondering too, Jess, is GPA feeding later in the season, is that posing more or less of a risk to uh, resistance management? Uh, to resistance management, uh, look, that's that that's a good question. Resistance resistance comes down to selection pressure. So mutations will evolve um, randomly, but if there is a selection pressure in the environment, those mutations that have evolved random, randomly will be selected for and they'll become more prolific in the population. So it really comes down to whether there's more selection pressure at that point of the season. Um, so, um, and, and that could change based on the region as well. And also based on the season, whether um, farmers are seeing GPA pop up a little later in the season. Certainly last year we were seeing, um, we were getting reports of GPA um, being found on stems and pods, but that also come down to when the chemistry can be used based on the, the label as well. Oh, great, thanks for that, Jess. And um, Sam, you covered a, a lot of content there around parasitic wasps. I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts on why the Diarotella rapi has become so commonplace compared to some other wasps? Um, well, I mean, we don't really know why, why it is. It's very interesting that it is, is the predominant wasp across the board. Uh, but there has been sort of research out that has said, uh, I think it was in North America or in Canada, that um, imported wasps were outcompeting a lot of the native species. And um, as part of my project, I've been going through historic samples. So a lot of museums have collections and the diversity of, of wasps, the aphid parasitoids that they've collected is, is so vast compared to what I'm finding in the, in the paddocks. And that's because Diarotella rapi isn't a native species. It's very cosmopolitan found across the board. Uh, and so one, one um, hypothesis is that it, it's come in and perhaps knocked out certain other native species that aren't sort of as well developed. I mean, if it's made its way sort of across the seas to Australia, it's obviously a pretty hardy species. Um, so that's probably why it's, why it's predominating everywhere. Interesting. And just a follow on question from that too. I mean, what are, you, what are you expecting to find with your piece of work on observed versus actual rates of parasitism? Uh, so we've done, we have done some pilot studies. Uh, when I was out monitoring uh, in previous years, I've sort of had a look myself. Uh, so I've sort of had a look at what it's like in Victoria. I don't know in terms of whether there's going to be a difference regionally, uh, but in terms of what you're seeing and, and what is actually happening, the two are not are not the same. Um, we know that from these pilot studies that I've been doing. Uh, I think it's a good indication if you're getting about 20%, then you know, in all likelihood you haven't got 90% parasitism rates. Uh, but it's something that it will be interesting to see how it turns out this year. I think it's very, it's going to be very variable. Uh, it would very much differ, I think, towards the end of the season when you've got a lot more hyperparasitoids coming in. Um, also, just, just as a quick side note, with the hyperparasitoids, they do also uh, cause the mummies to look a slightly different colour. They're usually a darker brown, uh, almost black at times, uh, than the sort of more golden uh, ones that we sort of see, see regular pictures of. Uh, so, but we're collecting all of those in. So uh, the long answer is, uh, sorry, the short answer is I don't really know uh, what we're expecting, uh, but the long answer is, in all likelihood, uh, it, it will throw up some good results that will that will surprise you, I think, in terms of 
it being very different, the, the actual parasitism rates than the observed parasitism rates. Great, thanks for that, Sam. And Jess, I might just come back to you quickly. Um, you mentioned two types of resistance there around metabolic being, you know, the detox or enzyme driven resistance and target site being on off. I mean, what is the risk of that metabolic resistance actually evolving into target site resistances? Yep. Well, um, look, they're two very distinct types of um, resistance and they arise from different mutations in different genes. So even within, for instance, um, metabolic resistance, which I was talking about, depending on, um, for instance, what the aphid is resistant to in terms of chemistry, you have a different kind of mutation um, arising from um, mutations in, um, in in the, in the genome of an aphid resistance to neonicotinoids compared to organophosphates. So as I, as I mentioned previously, mutations arise randomly. Um, and what this means is um, under selection pressure, they're more likely to be selected for, but there is um, unlikely to be a risk of a metabolic mutation um, evolving into a, a target site mutation. Oh, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. Now, Julia, um, help is available. Um, walk us through the PestFax Southeastern service and um, where people can go for some follow-up information and support. Yeah, sure. So, um, GRDC is funding a project called IPM for Grains. Um, it's delivered by the National Pest Information Network. So, we're pretty much entomologists from here at CESAR, uh, DPER, SARDI, QDAF and New South Wales DPI. Um, so PestFax South Eastern is uh, Caesars branch um, and we service Victoria and Southern New South Wales. Um, so we send out regular news updates um, and also provide um, management help and an ID service. Um, and I should say it's a focus on grain crops and pastures, but, uh, particularly sort of winter grains. Um, so yeah, you're more than welcome to, to send me samples. Um, I can understand sometimes it is a bit hard to send samples when you're looking for an ID. Um, so you can also send me photos. Um, if you do have a macro lens that you can pop on your phone, they're relatively cheap and it makes um, identifying photos a lot easier. So yeah, you can you can take them and send them through um, to our email address, which is uh, pestfax at caesaraustralia.com. Um, you can also visit our website, which is caesaraustralia.com. And on there, we've got other ways that you can get in contact and initiate contact with us. We've got our Twitter account, we've got our, um, our landline number, we've got a reporter app and also an online um, pest report sheet that you can submit your sightings through or request help. Um, on our website, we've also got a set of comprehensive fact sheets on over 50 species of um, pests and beneficials that you find in crops, in grain crops. Um, these are called pest notes um, and they're produced by various entomologists um, at, at CESAR and SARDI. So they're produced by both um, organisations. So I highly recommend you check them out, especially going into spring. It covers a number of pests that will show up in canola going into spring. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Julia. And just a reminder too, if you are joining us online, that there are those handouts that have been mentioned during the presentations available for direct download. Um, and look, a big thank you to, to both Julia, Jess and Sam for their presentations and insights. It's been fantastic. What I'm going to do is hand back over to Phil Bowden to give a quick session wrap up and talk about where to from here with the current GRDC project. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Carl. Uh, just to wrap it up, um, we had um, a series of workshops, we had uh, the, the crop walks, and now the webinar that's um, hopefully uh, given uh, farmers and advisors a good insight into what resources there are to back up uh, ITM. Uh, in, in grain crops and in particular uh, canola. So we've had a really good response uh, from all our uh, uh, participants and hopefully yeah, they can take those new skills uh, into uh, the new season. Uh, 
the, the webinar, I guess, highlights uh, what, a, what a great resource we've got uh, down at CEDA. Uh, this is the girls there, um, Samantha, uh, uh, Julia, and Jess. Uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a really invaluable uh, resource for us to be able to move, uh, to have uh, taxonomy and in the latest information about all the pests uh, and beneficial species. So thanks again, and uh, if you need any help, uh, you're, uh, you're um, a short call away, uh, and uh, you can access all this information. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs>